Hello, everyone. For those of you just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session is Radical Exchange in Asia. I'll turn it over to our moderator, Osama, to introduce himself, the panelists, and begin the session. Yeah. Hello, everyone. This is Osama from Pakistan. Uh, a warm welcome to the session. Uh, so this is, as you know, is the, is the Radical Exchange uh, panel on Asia, right? So we have speakers from Bangladesh, we have speakers from China, and other countries. So I will be moderating the session and I'll be also presenting my case for Pakistan. So first of all, uh, I'll like to kick this off by talking about Pakistan uh, and the radical exchange ideas. Uh, can, you, can you please have the slides, please? So yeah, so, the, so, so you know, one more thing that we will, taking, we will be taking the questions and answers um, in, in the end of the session. And uh, yeah, so please, Elizabeth, next slide. First of all, my introduction. As I've told you my name, my name is Samar Rizvi, and I am an economic and geopolitical analyst based in Pakistan. Uh, I've written for several English newspapers here in my country and other digital media outlets uh, abroad, such as Oil Price, Seeking Alpha, Business Insider, etc. cetera. Um, I'm also the founder of You and I Global, which is uh, an organization that focuses upon youth and creating pluralistic values uh, and and you know we we joined this by working on the sdgs as defined by the un so i there are two themes that we work upon one is equality of opportunity another is integration justice yeah so that is pretty much my introduction next slide so before we begin uh, my journey of radical exchange and its ideas here in pakistan it is uh, instructive to note that when we talk about Pakistan or other countries from the global south, and when we compare the ideas presented in the book, and we try to implement it here, as I have tried with my team, the, one of the things that we have learned is that there are lots of challenges, there are lots of uh, areas which need custom tailor-made versions of the original ideas as presented in the book or as the organization has uh, uh, you know made so for so so you know in the, from coming from a country in, you know in the global south we see that we don't have certain prerequisites that allow these ideas such as cost or quadratic voting or data as labor and other things to be implemented here in pakistan so i have learned that we need to work we need to collaborate with the government with the other actors with the other stakeholders in such a way that we come up with such a version of these ideas that are also relevant and also implementable in the real practical sense for the for the, for the said country. So, you know, now I'll move towards the two of the most pressing issues, two of the most aspects, you know, which have the most issues. One is political, other is economic. Uh, afterwards, I'll be introducing and which projects we are going to work upon and then customized version of cost and quadratic rating and in the end i'll you know conclude with invitation to connect and collaborate next slide please next slide please most pressing problems uh when i talk about these problems it is these are relevant to the ideas that we have worked upon during the past few years right so first, first of all, in politics, you know, there is a lack of accountability, transparency. And if we ought to, you know, for instance, we ought to implement a system of quadratic voting uh, to solve these things, we lack the main digital infrastructure in Pakistan. So once again, before we work on the ideas of the, of the organization, I have learned that we need to take a step back and build up the prerequisites, you know, build up the building blocks on which these ideas would be implemented. You know, there is a lot of uh, concentration of power in certain areas, certain families, certain people that also, you know, prove as a hindrance to these uh, uh, to these development or these progressive ideas to be implemented. But as same goes in the economic sector, uh, one of the most pressing issues we are facing, and it was also highlighted in the recent budget as well, was low tax revenues, and this tax revenue issue is highly relevant to the idea of cost for common ownership self-assessed tax system, right? 
what once again due to the lack of digital infrastructure due to the lack of a documented economy uh, implementing that system would require once again to take a step back and first of all move things uh, to online spaces uh, have digital identities have you know people involved in such uh, information systems that will make everyone trackable only then these things will be implemented uh, this will also result in increasing the tax base and you know we can as a talk we will there is a need to introduce new management systems for taxation for the uh, fbr department federal revenue board board of revenue and for the people working on the radical exchange ideas as well so there is a need to conform and collaborate with the government on these issues and what, one of the most important things that i think need a lot of work in pakistan is government digitization the the transaction the government transaction between the citizen and the government whenever he ought to pay a bill whenever he ought to um, you know renew his passport or identity card then he faces a lot of issues so once again digital infrastructure uh, comes into play and hence i've stressed it a lot so to this, to solve these issues that i've just uh, highlighted i am building i have been and i am building a team of people in major cities of pakistan right and i i intend to have 10 people at least from all those cities and provinces so that we can collaborate in a better way and next slide please uh, and and two of the most important parts that we want to work on is cost and second is quadratic voting the idea the the, the reason behind this is that cost is directly relevant to what our government is looking forward for these days to solve right we don't have tax base we we you know the property system is rigged lots of uh, lots of money is laundered and parked in in this area so i believe that the, to come up with a tailored version of cost system here in pakistan may be associated with the blockchain technology right the blockchain at one point will be creating a digital imprint and then will implement the cost system so and we can start always start it from a certain area from a certain city so you know uh, this will help us so once again it is cost as defined by the radical exchange but it is a little bit tweak version of it right and the other one is quadratic voting why quadratic voting the same thing as it has been explained in the book and is the purpose uh, it is because you know um, we have so many issues in the parliament discussed in the parliament but there is no representation of the people right so i think it is it would better to create a pool of people who have these quadratic votes and they can use it whenever there is a move there, there is a you know there is any business regarding their own uh, or relevant issue being discussed in the parliament so these are the two issues next slide please so and in the end you know i will be brief uh, you know i will just invite everyone to connect and collaborate even though you're not from pakistan or anywhere else i love to work with more ideas with more people and maybe we can come up with something bigger and this is my email you can always reach out to me thank you so much that was from my side and next i will invite mr najmu zaman and let me introduce him he is a senior product manager at wadwani foundation you know which helps to which helps startups and small and medium enterprises to build viable businesses he is one of the board of trustees of afs that provides intercultural learning opportunities and uh, naz is a part of radical exchange bangalore community and involved in bringing organizations together for lack for uh, you know to to come together uh, to work on equal access of to water better local governance and other ideas conducive to business so the floor is yours that was about thank you so much osama um elizabeth could you share the slides again so much that was you can share your screen now you can share your screen now please see me as the that provides intercultural learning together for that for uh, you know to to come together and to work on equal access of water better local governance and other ideas to do business so the floor is yours that's about all right so um i'm going to talk about quickly so osama already gave a great introduction so you can call me naz if it's because a really long name 
Uh, I'm gonna talk about radical exchange in India, but from a Twitter timeline specifically, because we want people to follow us on Twitter. So we started uh, last year, um, yeah, so it was almost a year ago, and uh, we had this meeting, a couple of us got together in Bangalore, and we were really excited to get started with radical exchange. And uh, at that moment of time, the biggest problem that Bangalore as a city was facing, and also India in a, as a whole was facing, was that we had a huge water crisis at that time. And there was groundwater depletion, and the, especially the underserved communities were not getting access to water. And so we decided to look at that problem at first and see how radical exchange could help us do that. So the first thing they decided to do was like build a systems map to identify the key stakeholders and incentives from roadblocks. And then we actually went ahead and we built the systems map. And uh, what we did was we really wanted to look at equity, well, water equity uh, in terms of distribution of public goods. So what generally happens is the underserved community is the one that pays the highest price and the underserved community is the one that also gets the least access. Uh, for example, if I take a specific example from Bangalore, um, the people who are living in apartments, they get direct water into the taps and it just costs them, uh, in terms of Indian rupees, it just costs them about 18 rupees per liter, uh, sorry, per kiloliter. But for, um, for these people who are underserved and they really have to go to places to get water and it's not even of good quality, they have to pay more than 100 rupees uh, per kiloliter, just, which is just appalling because they don't have the money to pay it. And people who do have the money to pay it are paying uh, almost 10 times lesser than these people. So we, we started looking at you know, what is the system that's around these communities that's making this happen? And what are the incentives and stakeholders? And we looked at religious institutions, you know, they're, they, the kind of interest groups they are following on social media, the kind of NGOs they connect with, the school, the credit system, the market. So we looked at all of these systems and we identified like three top areas of intervention. So we definitely understood that there was a huge disconnect between the knowledge and implementation. So there are these nonprofits working on the ground um, who, do not have any connect with what the government's trying to do. The government's uh, listening to one body that's doing some kind of survey and they say, this is the recommendation we, we tell you. That's completely disconnected from the ground reality. There is an academy, so the research institutions, uh, they're doing completely disconnected research from what's actually happening on ground. And because of all of this disconnect, um, there's just a lot of information asymmetry that comes in and the implementation is just not happening. And there's also a problem with irresponsible overconsumption. There is lack of awareness using in, because of the, uh, b because people don't know their information asymmetry and th that causes inaction because I don't know there's a problem. So we looked at all of this stuff and then we started looking at, okay, let's, let's try to gather more information. So we, we sat with uh, Ankit Bhargav of Sanctum Local. They're an urban planning um, nonprofit working at planning uh, uh, communities community spaces in Bangalore, uh, working in lake conservation, water conservation, air purification, waste management. And they really closely work with the government and also with other nonprofits. So we try to get some of their experience. Uh, there's a podcast on, out on, on our uh, Twitter handle that you can look at. And uh, so we, we try to understand what is the, exactly the problem. And I'll actually get to a really interesting project that we have st started. And uh, I'm pre pretty positive we can head in that direction with Sensing Local in terms of quadratic voting. Um, we also went to conferences trying to tr understand what the scientists are talking about. What's the academic research on this? And we, we even went and asked questions on, you know, what are you doing about lake conservation? And what do you think is a problem? And we, we started seeing some real disconnect between what they were doing in research and what was actually happening on the ground. So then we found this person uh, called Anand Malikavar. He's, he's the third piece of our problem, which is the person who does everything on ground, but doesn't have the means or the structure to get this knowledge to people. So this man is uh, this amazing man. He's called Lake Man, uh, Anand Malikavar, because this person single-handedly uh, rejuvenated uh, a lake uh, at first, and then he did it for four other lakes. So he rejuvenated five lakes all by his own, using the local community, using local resources, and just using traditional knowledge. Like he's not even a scientist. 
And but the problem was this person didn't have the structure or or the uh, organization to make sure that this can happen at scale. So what we did was we helped him structure a workshop. For, so he, this was the first time he was actually conducting a workshop and got a lot of these stakeholders and citizen group communities and nonprofits together into a room. And we just got them to listen to Anand Malgavar in the workshop format. And then we got that knowledge, we structured it, we, we open sourced it, we actually made a video on it. So I'll talk about that as well. So in, in terms of the water conservation, what we had been doing was we were trying to connect all of these different communities, all of these different groups, all nonprofits and stakeholders working separately to come together and start helping each other and working together. And then from this experience, what we also realized uh, while talking to Sensing Local for a long time is that there was a problem with local governance, which was not letting um, any of our efforts actually take root. And uh, one of the uh, things that the government had introduced uh, in India is called ward committees. Ward committees are these local governance bodies. And uh, they're, they're basically, for example, in a city, there are many zones. So a neighborhood can become a ward. And at the ward level, we have a corporator, the person who leads and who reports to the mayor, get the budgets approved. Uh, there's a board of citizens who the uh, corporator is accountable to. And then there's an engineer, which is uh, from the government. And this engineer is supposed to listen to all citizen problems and help them out. And then you have these meetings of the ward committee where all the problems are heard and the corporator and the engineer are supposed to solve these. The problem is that uh, First of all, these meetings are completely unstructured. They were not even happening to begin with. And uh, one of the initiatives that Sensing Local and another organization did actually made them start. And the big issue is that citizens, maybe five to 10 citizens would come to a ward committee meeting, even if there are like uh, 500,000 citizens in that ward. And uh, those five or 10 citizens would say that my pipe is leaking or there's garbage outside my door and I need help with that. And that's how the issues were getting solved. So there was no long-term thinking. There was no ward level thinking, like what is the system of this ward? What's the local need of this ward that we need to solve? And it, it was, so it started becoming a failure. So we, we actually collaborated with Sensing Local, going to these ward committee meetings, trying to figure out what they're trying to do. Now, what we are exploring right now is that uh, we want to see if we can use quadratic voting at the local governance level, at, the, at these ward committees, where the citizens, and especially the problem is that there are influential people in the group who say that this is what where the budget should go, and this is how we should solve issues, and these are the issues that we should, we should solve, and they, they, they do that. So with quadratic voting, we want to make sure that everyone who's a citizen and everyone uh, who is a part of that ward is able to vote, and everyone, it, it doesn't matter how much influence you have, it, it focuses on the number of issues that citizens are you know, really concerned about and making that process transparent. So we still need to build that infrastructure though and also get people to buy into that. Uh, but I think that's a step in the right direction. And also uh, we have been looking at, can we also use quadratic funding because there's budgets that the ward gets uh, to implement at the ward, but they're not being applied to the right issues and maybe quality funding can help us identify what are the right issues that we should put budgets in and what kind of matching should happen based on how much citizens want that issue to be solved. Uh, apart from that, we have been pretty, um, uh, very active in the protest space because we know that our voices need to be heard. So we were a part of the climate strikes that uh, had happened uh, organized by Fridays for Future. And then we have been really, really active at the CA and RT protests, uh, people who don't know what these protests are about. Uh, there is, was an act that the Indian government passed, it's called the Citizenship Amendment Act. And according to the act, uh, uh, only six religions would get uh, uh, any kind of citizenship in the country uh, after a particular time, period of, uh, period of time, if, uh, if they, were, they came to the country illegally. But, Following this, there is another act which is coming up, which is the National Registry of Citizens. It's a registry of citizenship, as it sounds. And uh, that will that could be a way to say that, okay, all of these people, especially affecting the underserved and the poor, and it has already started happening. We have seen this happening in the slums where they were told that you're illegal immigrants and you have to get out of here just based on the religion. And it, it targets the minorities, especially Muslims. 
uh, also the LGBT community because they don't uh, uh, really, there is no religion for LGBT. And also a lot of uh, people who are called Dalits. Uh, Dalits are a group of people in Hindu mythology. They're, they're supposed to be lower caste people. So they didn't have access to temples, even where the upper caste people used to go and they, they were oppressed and they were generally sewage workers and their community couldn't uh, get a lot of the privilege that they should have gotten uh, to start with. So it affects a lot of these people. So we are really active in these protests and trying to see if we can make any dent in that direction. So that's pretty much it that what we have been doing and we are trying to look at any ways to collaborate. This is how we do work right now. We do a goose method. So we do gather. We gather information from all kinds of sources for a problem, try to make sense of it, organize and structure it, and then open source it. So we have a Google Drive link and we have a podcast uh, that we have set up. And uh, although in terms of execution, we delegate that to the uh, organizations that are already working. Because I think in terms of uh, execution, empowering the organizations that are already in the space is much more useful than actually trying to do everything ourselves. So that's what we are trying to do, but we also want to learn from other radical exchange communities on how they're doing execution. Please follow us, we are on Twitter. Uh, everything that we do goes on Twitter, we have it at rxc underscore Bangalore. We have an open Google Drive, it's completely open sourced. You can come in, watch the videos on lake conservation, you can uh, take any information out of there, you can use it, distribute it, it's all open. It's uh, uh, there is no problem with licensing and uh, we'll put out more stuff there. Our podcast is also there. So just go and listen to it. Uh, that's it from me. And uh, I will hand it over to Osama to do the next introduction. And I think Eliza's next. Thank you, Nedra Zaman. It was really insightful and interesting of what you're doing in Bangalore. So my next speaker, I would like to invite, invite the next speaker. Her name is Elizabeth Fu. She is a PhD candidate in psychology at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, uh, a team member of, at the CAS Key Laboratory of Behavioral Sciences. Uh, she is also an ACS certified international psychology, psychological consultant and the co-founder of the Startup Now and the co-founder of Predicate Exchange China, right? And she has helped redesign um, several markets in China, including the National College Admission System, the Job Magic System of Boss Zipin, and China's Kidney Exchange System. So, Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Right. And she has helped redesign. Okay. Uh, um, thank you, Asma, for the nice introduction. So, for my system, part, um, I will first uh, introduce Zipin some in of the radical change and developments in so China. Elizabeth, the and then I'm going to uh, discuss some of the um, policy innovations uh, as well as technical innovations in China. So my current state is the timeline of the radical action development in China. And uh, The July event in, in Taipei is very was very successful, and then we invited the uh, Audrey Kang and uh, uh, Vitalik Brutlin for the discussion yeah. about uh, the radical markets and the radical July, exchange. The and uh, also in, in November, and the way
Okay, that's all. Is that all right? No, no. No, no. Okay, so let me continue. Um, okay, so in November, after the book reading events, that we have the um, we we have the online events, uh, which is a response to the which is a, which is a response to the pandemic, uh, uh, coronavirus pandemic, and uh, um, so Mr. Um, Kojima and I both discussed about the radical markets and the um, public health as well as radical markets and uh, and the charities and. My uh, speaker, uh, my microphone is off, and I'm mute, and I am not recording as well. Oh, yes. Okay, let me start again. Okay. Okay, so for uh, for this uh, for this events, and you can see the details uh, by just by scan the QR code on the uh, right bottom of the screen. So by now we have the radical markets um, in in three books in both the traditional radical markets and also. Um, modern Chinese uh, more modern Chinese book, and also by now we have already have eight local chapters in China. Um, the first, uh, we, you can scan the scan the QR code to join our group and to discuss about the new newest uh, uh, radical exchange information in China. So next, I'm going to discuss about. Uh, uh, the several radical uh, innovations. The first innovation is construction and uh, in housing. Um, so uh, in the Chinese, so China has the well-known Chinese miracles um, called Hui Shenshan and uh, Lei Shenshan Hospital. Um, hospitals, we build these hospitals in two weeks. And, uh, and this, uh, so how do we achieve that? That's because we use the tradition, we, we use the new materials and the way, um, uh, so traditionally, uh, the buildings were unmovable. And the, but uh, in our, like uh, in for our Huashengshan and Leishengshan hospitals, we use the prefabricated um, buildings. We uh, designed our models uh, in a computer and then assembled uh, assembled uh, these materials when they are transported to the trans uh, to the destination. So uh, in this way. And also in the future, the buildings and the lands can be separated. So uh, it provides a very good setting for us to um, for us to apply the cost uh, in China's housing market. Um, because if a land is not appropriate to match the, uh, the buildings that uh, can maximize their usage, then this house or the buildings can be auctioned away. So in equilibrium, the lands and the houses and owners will be efficiently matched in the future. 
And besides the movability of the houses, and all the houses in China will become intelligent in a few years. And as long as you have a smartphone, you can control your home security, the electricity, the light, you can play your music, you can open and close your doors. Um, and also you can control your temperatures. So uh, our government aims to uh, in seven year, uh, in five years, 35 of the old traditional buildings will be replaced by those new movable and intelligent houses. Um, and the second uh, radical exchange in China um, is, uh, is, uh, is a project that I have been working on. So um, traditionally, uh, the Chinese patients who need an organ uh, receives, receives organs uh, from a deceased donor or from their relatives. And uh, so we propose to the health authorities for the kidney exchange and lipid exchange ideas, which have been uh, successfully implemented in the US and other Western countries. So we propose to the Chinese transplantation, uh, Chinese transplantation laws that could be uh, adapted to allow living donor, living, uh, living organ donation between non-relatives. And we can also improve the organ donation incentives by proposing some new policy schemes. And uh, we also propose that China should uh, cooperate with other countries to share the organ and patient pools. And the third radical development is in labor market. And, uh, mm, and this is also a uh, work that I worked on. And we, China, we have several centralized uh, job match platforms, but we all, uh, we, all of them are using the decentralized job matching process using AI technologies, such as Boss Jiping, Lie Ping, and uh, Zhilian Zhaoping. And uh, in these platforms, we have the potential to apply our uh, quadratic voting models. For example, the job seekers are asked to choose from different job types. And if they are assigned with some tokens, then they can assign their weights and their different preferences to jobs. And uh, so to match, so we can improve their match qualities and match efficiencies. Um, it is the same for the employers. So if the employers can also um, vote for their um, vote for their best candidates and also vote for their uh, uh, vote to choose who to interview, then they will lead to a better offer or better contracts. And also in the platforms they have the, in the companies itself, they have a CRM systems, uh, which is to match customers to salesmen. So salesmen can also use the tokens to uh, to customize their own preferences to choose different types of customers. And the fourth, the fourth uh, innovation radical exchange is in the payment assistance. Um, it is a digital currency electro electronic payment, which is issued by the Central Bank of China. And uh, currently it's, um, uh, it's tested within a small group of people and uh, by the Agri uh, agricultural bank. And it will be released in public by the end of this year. And it is just this, uh, it is just a replacement of the of the man, of the paper of the paper currencies. So it's, it will transform the way that we pay uh, we make our payment. And also, um, we have a lot of uh, radical innovations in the business models, such as uh, taps. TAPS ABC model um, and, uh, and Hai Tao Long, um, who is a professor of STAP, now we'll discuss about it later. And also we have the 90-day STAP successful system, which is to say that uh, we help the uh, projects to, uh, to become successful in 90 days, as long as they follow the steps uh, that is designed in this system. So I'm going to leave my time to Asma to the introduction of uh, Hai Tao Long. Thank, thank you so much, Elizabeth. It was very interesting. It was very interesting. So my, the next speaker is Hai Tao Long, and uh, he's, uh, he's a business, he's the lead business consultant from Pundun, excuse my pronunciation, and Intelligent Venture. He's, a, he's an expert on the top level digital design of business strategy. Uh, he's also an investor and an advisor for enterprises, especially in the areas of internet and finance. For example, Startup Now and CCTV. He studied at West Point and is now involved in Radical Exchange Beijing and Guangzhou communities. So the floor is yours. Hi, uh, 
Do we have Mr. Haifao long hair? Yes, can you, can you see us now? Because we cannot see your screens. Hello, hello. hello. So, so, so Haitao will, will discuss about the TAPS ABC model, and okay. uh, I will be his translator. Hello, hello. Okay. 大家好, 我即将用中文发言. Hello, everyone. I'm going to speak in Chinese. 我叫龙海涛. My name is Haitao Long. So, uh, for the invitation of the host. 给大家分享我们咨询公司的TSPABC模型 um, To share um, our TSPABC model um, to us, to the audience 它是我们咨询公司在为客户服务的时候 um, this, is, um, this is a model that uh, we, use, uh, so we use to serve our, our, uh, our firm customers 为这个客户设计分配制度 um, to design to design the allocation rule for the customers. So, um, it is a tool that we use. 那这个理论呢, 来自于我们的商业模式的咨询. And uh, this theory is from our um, business model consulting consulting method. 以及分配制度IT系统的实践. As well as uh, um, allocation mechanism, IT system, IT system application. 过去, In the past, we usually the past, we often, uh, we often realize, realize our model by an IT system. 那么，什么是TSPABC理论呢？ So what is TSPABC theory? 我们假定一个企业，它需要寻找它的用户。嗯, um, if we assume that our firm wants to seek his customers. 企业，我们把它称之为P。嗯, um, for firm we call it P platform. 客户，我们把它称之为C。For the customer, uh, we call it C. 企业面对的客户有很多种 So the P faces different types of customers 企业内部有执行团队 我们称之为 A um, in, in the, within, within, the, within the firm we have the operational team we call it A 为了将自己的 为了将自己的这个, to maximize the customer's number, we need, a, uh, we need some intermediary business sources, we call it B. 有的时候我们还将交付客户的产品生产或者是服务的交付的职能放在企业外部,我们称之为S。um, sometimes we uh, um, sometimes we put uh, we put the supply side on the outside of the firm and we call it S. 这么多个角色构成了一个交易结构，我们称之为 P. So these different roles consists of the consists uh, consists of the transaction structure and we call it T. 那么 内部的黄色的这条线称之为企业管理的边界 um, So this yellow line is the boundary of the firm, of the firm management 外部的这条黄色的边界我们称之为企业生态的边界 um, so, the, so the yellow line outside we call it, we call it on the firm's ecosystem's boundary 用这样的六种角色就可以描述一家企业 so six rows, uh, we can use it to for describe uh, a firm. 那么，一既然是企业，就有上游。嗯， um, so uh, for um, since it is uh, a firm, then it has its supply side. 上游的企业其实也是一个 tables. 
uh, the, the firms on the supply side is also a TAPS model. 企业下游要么是终端,要么也是一个TAPS. So the demand side of the, of the firm, um, it is either a terminal, uh, terminal customer, consumers, or it is also a, an, an enterprise. 与此同时,企业还有同行. At the same time, um, the, um, the, the, the firm also has its parallel, parallel enterprises. 同行, Competitors. 有自己的企业内部, they have their own uh, teams. 也有自己的客户, and their customers. And their intermediary business sources. And their supply chains. And we call it the T1. 有的同行, um, some of the competitors. 没有供应商, does not have a supply side. 那这个我们把它称作为T2. We call it T2. 以此类推, so and so forth, we have T3, T4. T4, yeah. And these are all competitors of T0. The levels of, of competitors are different. It is um, basically it is because their roles are different. And we also have similar, similar firms in the industry. And this consists of the firm's ecosystem. The vertical side is the, uh, is the industry, and the, and the horizontal line is called the Mm -hmm. Okay, it's called, it's called the uh, horizontal, horizontal industry. Mm -hmm. So this is a TAPS ABC model. Um, there are two types of exchanges of transactions. From the of um, based on the boundaries of the exchanges, we have the external exchanges and the internal exchanges. From the aim of the transaction, we have the, we have the um, customer-based transaction and the, and the, and the transfer-based transaction. Okay. So let's look deeper into it. Now, so, why is the type of model is so related to radical markets? Because it relates to the firms, the firms, the firms allocations mechanism. As well as the business models design. 举例, For example, 接下来我将用TAPS um, I'm going to use a TAPS model. 来演示全世界95%的制度. Um, to, I'm going, I'm, I'm going to show how the TAPS model can cover 90% of the, uh, of the mechanisms in the world. 第一种, the first one. 如果一个企业, if a firm. 自己内部构建营销团队, has its own operational team. 打造开发客户的这个直营团队, and uh, which can uh, enlarge the customer's pool by its own. 我们把它简称为A1. And we call it A1. 啊, 有业务员, 业务总监, 业务经理, For example, they have the managers, uh, senior managers, and so on. 同时, 为了服务好客户, 
at the same time to serve the customers better. We have A2 team. No, we have A2 team. We can call it a marketing team and a service team. That kind of model, we call it the customer service model. And we call it the direct internal sales model. At the same time, if the customer service team is not satisfied, we can call it the direct internal sales model. At the same time, if the customer service team is not satisfied, we can call it the direct internal sales model. At the same time, if the customer service team is not satisfied, And we call it an external intermediary model or external partner models. We Sometimes we develop our customers to become our, our, our intermediaries or business, or business partners. We call it a terminal sociality new retailing model. Some firms are a mix of these models. And we call it a mixed model. And the other is less, than, less often seen. For example, the, the firm has its own content producing teams and circulation teams. 和流通的产品。To distribute the content, um, and also the products. 投递到，投递到，通过媒体或者是渠道投递到消费者手上。To place, to place them to the customers, um, by by media or by intermediaries. 我们称之为直投模式。And we call it a direct circulation model or direct placement model. These five types cover the majority of the companies' business model. So these five kinds of models, these five kinds of models, these five kinds of models mainly covers ninety-five percent of the of the models of the firms in the world. Companies use different models. When the firm uses different models, the amount of money they get is completely different. And how they allocate their profits is totally different. For example, the first one is 30 percent. The second time is is about 50 percent. The third one is only 5 percent. The fourth one is 5 percent. The fifth one is about 65 percent. 第五种大概是百分之二十左右。And the direct circulation model is about twenty-five percent. 那这个制度是可以通过这个制度的分配是可以通过区块链去实现的。And this kind of this all these models can be realized by using using blockchain techniques. 现在。Now. 我们。用商业模式，除了可以进行制度的分配之外，还可以进行商业模式的创新。嗯、um, ，not only not only we can use this uh use these models to allocate to allocate the resources, but also we can innovate based on these models. 比如 ，for example， 我们把一个合作伙伴的职能拆分。嗯、um, ，we can 嗯、um,。Uh, we can divide. We can divide the role of our external partners. 拆分为 S, A, B, C. So divide them into A, B, and C. 做哪个地方的工作就拿哪个地方的钱。Um, to which areas you are working on, then you obtain your revenue from which area. 与此同时，我们还可以把一种客户变成另外，把一种角色变成另外一种角色，称之为变性。At the same time, we can. Uh, we can turn, turn, turn one row into another row, and we call it a change. Exchange. 把渠道变成我们内部的团队。For example, we can turn an external intermediary to our own, own team members. 享受内部团队的分红。Um, to share, to share our, to share our internal profits. 这个叫变性。And this is called exchange. 改变性质。To change the nature of the of these partners.
，还有叠加。And also, um, this is the um accumulation. 将两种不同的词能叠加在一种角色上。To accumulate different roles on a one row. 这三种方法。On these three methods. 在实践中有丰富的内容。Um, have rich contents in have have rich applications in the real world. They can bring the business model innovation and business relationships to life. And they can um they can they can renovate they can renovate the uh the business model um innovation and the and the firm's partnership. Because of time, um because we have limited time. 没有办法把这个给大家分享详细的这个企业操作案例。I cannot talk t h e m in more detail。那我就分享在这里。Uh, so this is what I want to share with you。非常荣幸。Uh, thank you so much。那我称我叫普，江湖称我为普顿先生。People call me Mr. Putin。对 ，Putin。Putin。对，那我的中文名叫龙海涛。My Chinese name is Hai Tao Long. 很高兴与大家认识。It's very nice meeting with with you. 嗯，我啊就就分享到这。Thank you, thank you. It was a great presentation. And before I introduce my next speaker, I would like to say that we are running a little bit short of time, and I'll request the other two speakers, the remaining two speakers, if they can, you know, be a little brief, so that we can we also have few questions. And so that we can just wrap it up uh, under the time, right? So my next speaker is uh, Menako Kojiyama, who, who is the CEO of Andromeda, a blockchain company that aims to promote the development of blockchain techniques and blockchain communities. She was formerly an ex. She was formerly in the DIA team, the co-founder of Gpool.net, and the founder as well as the organizer of the Shanghai. Cryptocurrency Study Group. Uh, she is the co-founder of Radical Exchange China and is the organizer of Radical Exchange Community in Shanghai. So the floor is yours, Minato. Your 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 mic is mute. We cannot hear you. Yeah, you can, you can talk. Uh, I, I believe, Menako, there is some issue and we cannot hear you. Yeah, hello. No, we still have one speaker left. That is why I prompted everyone that there is, you know, uh, a shortage of time. So. Uh, I there is another speaker after her, so yeah, I think we if if both the speakers can limit themselves to four or five minutes, we can do it. Yeah. Okay, Manako. Uh, we can't. I can't hear you. It seems that Monaco is facing some technical issues. Uh, is is Duan Li present at the moment? Yeah, we cannot hear her. Yeah. If she's dialed in on her phone, potentially her phone is on you. I'm readmitting I, her. I think so. I think so. So I. Now she's back. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. So I'm um, sorry. So in 1980s, people might be fired simply because they are less than or gay in the labor agreement. In 1986, 
No state in the United States allows same-sex marriage. And in Asia, same-sex marriage was first legalized last year in Taiwan. And, but marriage equality is on, on, uh, ongoing struggle and not about over. Radical markets is all about designing creative mechanism to achieve first best and the second best. And today in po policy market, we have project voting and project funding. And in the labor market, we have VIP. In data market, we have the right to ask and pay. In good and service market, we have common ownership self-assisted assist, tax. And radical markets reminds us that we need to move away from the comfortable zone, both in morality and law. So could we come up with some radical market solution for relationship even without the legal validity? The answer should be true. Around the world, there has been a general trend towards ensuring equality rights for women within marriage and legally recognizing the marriage of interface, interracial, and same sex, or even between polyamorous. This trend coincides with the broad human rights mo movement. There are three basic building blocks inside marriage psychology, physiology, and economic. The first two parts of of it already established by their own. So let's talk about the third part. So now we have uh, those three different methods to achieve this. The first, we could use multi-sig wallet, whether through a hard wallet or a group of smart contracts, while wallet since marriage could be viewed as a set of contracts. Multi-sig stands for the multi-signature, which is a specific type of digital signature that and make it possible for two or more users to sign a document as a group. Every family member with the ability to make money now can voluntarily handing over a part of their salary into the multi secret wallet and vote to decide how to use their family fund, either buy a car, a house, or an oven, or invest into the compound to earn passive income. And by the way, respect and involve the partnership in the decision making process is one of the three important ways to build a happy marriage and avoid divorce. In a recent article called The Passion Economy and the Future of Work said that there are now there are now more ways to capitalize the creativity. Users can now build audience at scale and turn their passions into livelihood, whether they, that's playing a video game or producing video content, this has a huge implication for internship and what we will think of as a job in the future. So uh, let's take Camila as an example. Camila is a crypto artist. She has created a personal token called Kami with 2 million in total. To better publicize the digital artwork, Camila starts a daily newsletter, people who hold more than 1,000 Kami will be regarded as a subscriber. The above story is a fictional one, but the person token like Kami is real. Here are also uh, some more application of personal tokens, aka social money or state capital. So here, um, um, last week, a group of personal token pioneers hold an online meetup uh, to talk about their personal token application. You can see each of participants need to stake a few of the personal token to redeem a ticket. And the people who attend the meetup will divide all the stake token whose owner didn't show up. Just like what we do during the Easter Denver, right? But this time we will use your own personal tokens. Here is uh, another example. Uh, this man called the Dr. Quest running an online retro computer historical, historical museum and he issued a personal token called Retro to raise money for the website and provide a different level of accessibility for his online Retro compute, computer. 
Remember, personal token is a long tail and micro, micro payment scenario. They will be more powerful when binding with a liquidity contract so that people can could buy and sell on the market even without the order book. To achieve this, you could either stake enough liquidity by your own or run a liquidity initial liquidity offering campaign to rising to rising in the necessary liquidity. But be aware, providing liquidity do have some risk. And meanwhile, the risk is the twin of the benefits. Those who are willing to take the risk must be your true 100 true friends. And let's open source the infrastructure as well as the token API, which would involve third party developers to build different kind of decentralized app on the top of this personal token and achieve more. This is the only way we could unleash the true potential of this new kind of capital instrument. If we, if we regard the friendship and love as a continuous spectrum, then in the future, relationship might be de digitalized as a long-term liquidity provider for each other. Personal token will not only be a tool to take personal brands, but also be used to build a future community as well as future family. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, uh, our next, uh, you know, uh, before inviting the next speaker, I just request, you know, we are, uh, we we have only ten minutes left, and if you can wrap your speech in those minutes and leave some time for the questions, right, so we can answer them as well. So, the introduction for the next speaker, his name is Li Duan. Uh, he's the head of Blockchain Economic Research Center of Sichuan Quality Development Institute. He is committed to promoting and applying blockchain technology in industrial solutions. Uh, the research center provides business application uh, implementation and risk avoidance, cutting edge technology services, and enterprise blockchain strategy consulting. He is member of uh, Reddit Exchange Chengdu community, and he you know he brings together industry experts, consultants to promote industrial development, improve local governance. The stage is yours, sir. So I will ask the translator of him. Okay. Um, uh, Okay. Um, just okay. Uh, okay. okay. Um, okay. um, so, um, so Li Duan's topic is about the main so crowdfunding. Okay. Uh, so Yan Zoe Jesau, um, woman, Susan, Sanya Fasa, and Yu Yuan, um, Omi and Jo Tong Sin, Zui, Zui, Bang, um, Ishe, Chi, Zo, Tanya, Chukan, and the Yin Yong Yi, Fanny, Ho, Guido, Fu. Okay, so let me first introduce my institute. I'm from the Blockchain and Economic Research Center in Sichuan Province. And so we mainly provide uh, consulting services and structures for the firms, uh, for, for firms' blockchain, blockchain uh, strategy. And uh, we aim to um, promote the industrial the blockchain applications in the business areas and also provide uh, uh, regulation services. Okay. Um, 我们这个民宿众筹的项目的客户是一家成都郊区的旅游地产公司。So the customer of our project is from the tourism real estate company. Okay.呃，民宿项目它本质上是一家旅游地产的项目，然后有嗯建设、经营和流转。um, so the main source project is basically uh, also a tourism real estate project, and uh, it has uh, it it mainly has the construction, uh, transfer, and the operations um, part. Okay. 嗯，在财务部分的话，最主要包括经营的成本，然后房租租金以及那个利润的分成。and for the, for the financial part, we have the operational cost, the rent, and the allocation of our revenue and the profits. 
嗯，当嗯、呃、我们、哦、我们的客户呢，希望通过特色乡村的文化，为这些旅游的用户带来难忘的一个生活体验。To say, uh, we hope to we hope to provide the different feelings, uh, for our customers through our unique culture, uh, in our cultural special cultural villages. 嗯，在我们的这样子的一些调啊、呃、研究中间，我们发现国内的很多的知名的投资人都在关注这个方向。Um, our research finds that uh, many uh, investors in China, famous investors in China, are also paying attention to Ming Su's crowdfunding projects. Um, 众筹，呃，民宿的众筹最主要有两个方向，一个是股权的众筹，一个是消费的众筹。So there are two types of crowdfunding. One is equity-based crowdfunding. The other is customer-based crowdfunding. 嗯，股权众筹的用户最主要关注的是投资的收益。Um, the customers of、uh, equity-based crowdfunding pay attention pay attention to the profit and the revenues. 嗯，消费众筹的用户最主要关注的是活动的体验以及额外的、嗯、一些嗯那个福利。Um, so uh, the customers of consumer-based crowdfunding are paying more attention to travel experience and uh, the prices. Ah, in okay. Um, the main risk comes from the equity-based crowdfunding. Um, the main risk comes from the equity-based crowdfunding. Um, 其中经营风险是最大的，嗯，最大的一个隐患。Um, among other risks, um, the operational risk is the largest risk. 嗯，其中运营团队能力不善会导致投资的失败。Um, the uh, the inability of operational teams can cause the failure of investment. 嗯嗯，基金资市场这本书呢，为我们提供了一些启示。Um, the book Radical Markets gave us some inspirations. 嗯，在书里，嗯，提到了产权、集体决策、移民、投资和大数据。Um, this book talks about、uh, property rights, group decision making, immigration, investment, and big data. 嗯，啊，我们可以利用拍卖的形式，把民宿的经营权交给最能够运营好它的。这样子的团队。嗯、um, ，We can use an auction to assign our main source resources to the team who is most good at operating them. 嗯，特色乡村它是一个嗯，就是民宿的综合体，它需要一些集体的决策。嗯、um, ，The co the special cultural village is a is a collection of different main source. And it consists of the decision, the decision, group decision making. 嗯，产区品牌呢，它是属于特色乡村的一个嗯公共的产品，然后它有它的标准定价模型，可以由二阶投票来实现。嗯、um, ，so the region's IP, um,、uh, is a public good that can be priced by the quadratic voting method. 嗯。在书里还提到了数据劳动力市场。The book also mentions the uh data labor market. Data labor market. 嗯，有一个区块链项目叫 Ocean Protocol， 它嗯就实现了数据经济的一个原型。嗯、um, ，a project called Ocean Protocol realized the digital economy. 嗯，在这个模型中间。Digital. Okay. 在这个模，嗯，在这个模型中有数据的生产者，有消费者。So in the digital economy model, we have the um data producer as well as data consumers. 嗯，通过这个网络和市，通过这个市场，数据可以转换成资产。嗯、um, ，Through this market, data can transform the um. Can be transformed to an asset. 嗯，基于以上的一些启发，然后我们
会结合民宿众筹和区块链来实现一个激进的特色乡村。So based on these ideas, we can combine the Minsu's crowdfunding and the, and the blockchain to promote the radical um, cultural um, cultural special villages development. 嗯，这样的话，我们，嗯，我们大家就可以把精力和时间，嗯，投入到这些体验上面。嗯、um, ，so in this way we can um have more time to experience our travel rather than accumulation of our wealth. OK， 嗯，好，谢谢大家啊，<笑>那个谢谢雨晴的翻译。OK， thank you everyone. So thank you so much. Thank you to all of you uh, for your for sharing these wonderful insights. Uh, I now have you know few questions from the attendees, and uh, you know I'm going to go ahead and ask a few of them. So here is a very interesting question. Uh, you know how can we think of water, air, and soil as public property and use principle from radical exchange to prevent the damage caused by you know crops due to negative externalities. That was Zaman. Maybe you were working on this thing. You'd like to, you know, rain. Yeah, I would love to answer that. Um, actually, the talk, one of the talks yesterday, the, the Gitcoin talk, was uh, one of the most useful that I thought was from the perspective of distribution of public goods, and that's what also yesterday we were discussing that with people attending local, and uh, I think that's a pretty good, strong concept which has been applied. To Gitcoin and to the uh, to the open source software world, but I think uh, we need to start looking at really at local governance level. How can we apply uh, something like quality funding, uh, where if uh, but but there's still a, there's still a problem. But I would say we can apply quality funding to distribution of water, distribution uh, of uh, food, and trying to figure out you know how many people need it. Now the problem is. That it's not as simple as that because uh, what happens in terms of let's say water or food uh, is that even if you do quadratic funding, it's a majoritarian. Uh, it becomes a majoritarian problem because uh, QV and QF, in a sense, uh, want look at the number of people that yeah. uh, want something, and in a majoritarian economy, or uh, which is also one of the flaws of democ democracy, is that. A majority of people who have access to the platform to say that I want this will be be the people who would say that I want this, whereas the the people who don't have the power to say that will still be left out and they won't be heard, and it won't go to the right people. So it becomes a huge problem in terms of figuring out. We know that majority of people want this, but what about the minority that need this and are still not getting the, their power heard? And I still don't have a, a an answer to that. Yeah. And, and also, Najam, I would like to just uh, you know build on that is you know uh, for this to happen for this quadratic voting and funding, there is also a step before this, which is the necessary technology, technological or administrative you know structure that we have we should have. So um, if we talk about the global south or most of the Asian countries, not the Asian tigers, we will face these issues as well, right? So yeah, there is another question. There is another question that talks about. Uh, were you, any of you uh, were able to listen to the keynote address by Audrey Tang? What? Well, if yes, you know there is a question relevant to that. Was anyone able to? Okay, I was. So there is another question. You know, what are the ways to help those in Asia who are underprivileged or oppressed due to their ethnic, race, religion, or culture? You know, or geography. What are the ways we can help those? Uh, Elizabeth, can you? Would you like to take a? Okay. So the question is, um, how can we help those who are underprivileged or oppressed or oppressed due to the uh, race, religion, economic status, or geography? Yeah. So like, yeah. So like in China, for example, we have uh, uh, some uh, some people from the rural areas. Maybe they are discriminated. Uh, in the in the urban areas, and nowadays I think uh, this uh, our governments have been like subsidized 
the uh, subsidize the rural area. For example, like uh, we construct a lot of new buildings, and uh, we also um, we also assign them a lot of uh, like a, like lands for them to um, for them to become rich in China. And also, um, I, I don't think there is a lot of oppression um, in China due to race because we um, we although we have uh, 50, 56 different races, um, but uh, we uh, we we see we, we don't see them very different from us. This is this is what I see um, from from at least from my region. Yeah, and. Uh, yeah. For the economic status, yeah, I think I agree. There is, there is a huge um, wealth inequality, e income inequalities in China, and uh, the rich may discriminate uh, the poor, but uh, but also um, the rich also helps helps the poor the poor people a lot. So um, I think it's just a statistical discrimination, not a, not a yeah, not as a. Mm, not as a true discrimination in people's heart. This is what I have experienced in China. I would quickly okay. uh, add to this. Um, uh, there is a really interesting talk today uh, from Democracy Earth, um, which was by Santiago. And it, it was really looking at identity and how can we identify, identify people as humans. But I think it also applies very well to a problem and you know, how do you get things to under, under privilege to the economic status. And the biggest problem that uh, comes in when you're trying to help them is to even to try to identify the right people and if the right humans are getting those reparations and getting yeah. uh, whatever the welfare is trying to be uh, you know, sent to them. And in that respect, it's really important if we can use an identity system which does not even just identify you as a human, but it also identifies and probably using probabilistic identity to what's the probability of you being the person from that oppressed community or what's the probability of you being from a person from that uh, oppressed geographic community and the number of hours you spend in may maybe some other circles, uh, the number of uh, you know, programs you're enrolled in and using kind of that data, uh, can we figure out who are the people who should actually get that? And then we could go and talk about how do we get those goods to them. Yeah, certainly, very well said. Uh, Minako, would you like to add something to this? Uh, okay, I think we should. Uh, maybe, yeah. if, maybe I can talk. Uh, okay, so Li Duan, just is that they, just is, have a problem, just is, ah, just is, Asia, just is, maybe some people, ah, for example, is because, ah, because they have their religion, or their religion, or their economic situation, or their geographical position, 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 or 就是李端这个问题他们觉得就是说跟你比较相关然后希望你能够回答一下然后我可以继续当你的翻译就我目前所知的情况的话没有因为中国的文化就是中国本身是一个多民族的文化的一个国家你能再说一遍吗因为刚
what was the biggest challenge, the roadblock uh, you you encountered in setting up a, a radical exchange chapter? So, if you allow, I would like to go first on this. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that I have noticed is it, it's it's you know you have to stir the people's interest in this. You have to sell the idea. Other you have to you know make others buy this story. So that was the first hindrance that I felt. You know, if I'm talking uh, to someone about these ideas presented in the book, so they will have to believe in them that they really work, and only then they'll be willing to join. And secondly, there was this um, there was this uh, hindrance of a con con conventional mindset. You know, uh, who was not ready to accept uh, these new uh, techniques with the use of technology and to improve the old systems as we have been doing things. So not many people were interesting in the interested in the, interested in this, and also because it was also going to affect many, uh, uh, you know, what this call as, uh, it's, you know, yeah, ulterior motives of people. People gain through these inconsistencies and inefficiencies that we have in the system right now. So if something is going to eradicate that, those who were benefiting from that system would definitely oppose. So these were the few things that I felt. Uh, were the hindrances, and I still face those hindrances while I try to forward the message of radical exchange. So, Nadir Naj Zaman, would you like to go next? Yeah, definitely. Um, when we started the chapter, the biggest hindrances were definitely two of them. One was that the radical exchange ideas are really grand, and like at a macro level, to when you start looking at them. And it's really hard for people to see, and sometimes people who don't even come from blockchain, and you're talking about a lot of blockchain ideas in radical exchange, for example, it's really hard for them to see how can we just implement this idea at say the local governance level or implement this idea in some of the projects. For example, one of the people we are working with is trying to see how we can incentivize people to uh, do water conservation uh, in their own communities using radical exchange ideas, but it's really hard to see the theory being applied to practice. And that's why people have some problem trying to understand how do we actually get started. The second problem that we definitely faced um, was finding the people that are radical exchange-ish, which I mean is that yeah. you know, a lot of people could come in and say that, hey, I want to be part of the community, I want to change, I want to change society, but changing society in, in itself is like a big, huge term but then people have different ideas of how they want to change society and what they want to do. It's really hard to find people who want to work probably in the same thread. Uh, and I, I don't mean that everyone has to agree to the ideas in radical markets, but at least have the same kind of thread so that we can all follow along and work on similar kind of projects because it's really difficult to get people on the same same path. So yeah, those, those yeah. are definitely two that we still have been facing, yeah. Absolutely. So we haven't heard from Minako. Minako, would you like to add to the, your experience? Uh, so, I believe that the cool part, uh, the crucial part is how to involve the developed into the local community. So, uh, for example, in the last uh, Git, Git and uh, and the radical change, we 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 set up a group of de local developed to uh, to as a team to uh, come up our solution to get the boundary of the one of the uh, the hexagon. So I believe the if there are more developers come to this part of the social experiment, we can okay. achieve more. Okay. okay. And, and I quickly want to add one more thing uh, is Sorry. that yeah. w one problem that we have faced when we're still looking for answers is that we have created this chamber of people um, who talk alike and uh, we don't really have good representation from the underserved communities. It's really hard to get them representing because they don't also uh, have, they have problems understanding the ideas itself. So how do we actually get those underserved communities who we want to bring into the conversation, but we can't because we can't get the idea across to them. Yeah, Elizabeth, uh, finally. Okay, so I think uh, the challenges I face is the one um, to establish the chapter in Beijing is that there's a, uh, the uh, maybe the opposition from the government. They are um, because like the government, um, they want to have an independent system that is different from the Western Western countries. So, um, like for example, the radical exchange and uh, they block our uh, like the websites. 
and uh, we have to use a VPN to view this, to participate in these events to get news from the radical exchange. So mainly this information are blocked, um, blocked. So there are not so many people know about the radical exchange. So it's very hard for us um, to, to do the recruitment. And also when we're talking about uh, radical exchange ideas to the people and they just feel that it's so, it's so far away from their real life. Why should I care about this? So they are, I think that most of the Chinese people are satisfied about their current life. They do not want to, they are not willing to make changes. So this is a, um, the biggest challenge I have been facing um, in running the chapters in Beijing. Okay. Okay, so that was all. And you know, before we go, I would like to thank each one of you for taking out time to speak. And it was really interesting and insightful. Uh, you know, your projects, your progress, everything was great. And uh, questions.